Hello and welcome to this Human Rights Europe podcast. With me today to discuss recent human rights themes is Miro Griffiths, a disability rights campaigner and lecturer in sociology at the John Moores University in Liverpool in the United Kingdom. Miro, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. So, for our first topic, Miro, let's discuss the election of the new Human Rights Commissioner. The winning candidate will be chosen by the members of the Parliamentary Assembly when it meets tomorrow in Strasbourg. It's easy to imagine, Miro, that the entry of the successful candidates will be full, but what kinds of issues would you like the winner to focus on over the six years of his or her mandate? Sure. So I think a good starting point is to recognize that uh, throughout our analysis of human rights issues, that uh, human rights has always been under threat. Uh, and without naming any, any specific countries or member states, I think we can see that uh, foreign and domestic policy shows what I would probably refer to as utter contempt for the guarantees of social and economic rights for marginalized people. So as a starting point, I think there's something around recognizing the, the kind of gold standards of the UN Charter and the conventions, uh, which are appropriate to the discussions that we're having. And I think that there's a real need to map uh, the existing articles against the living standards of those that the, uh, the Commissioner has, has particular relevance for, because we are seeing emerging issues coming out affecting disabled people, affecting uh, refugees and, 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 um, and migrants, and also around this demographic time bomb affecting older people as they kind of transition into using various uh, services and having their living conditions um, scrutinized and kind of undermined by this, by this uh, economic and political uh, direction that we're going in. So I think there's something around this, this mapping analysis that needs to take place and to show c concrete evidence as to why people are frustrated um, and, and not having the, the living standards that they expect. And that leads me on to another point, I suppose, which is how to ensure that we are giving enough opportunity for people who are mar marginalized to come forward and describe and explain their frustrations and their issues around uh, human rights. Because I think so often we kind of conflate these two issues together, this idea of describing uh, marginalization and then explaining why it happens. I think that a commissioner should take some direction in trying to steer this conversation um, and actually ensure that people are getting the opportunities to feed in their views. Now, as somebody who is a disability rights activist and also a sociology lecturer, uh, when you look into your crystal ball over the next six years, do you see issues emerging which you think the future uh, Commissioner for Human Rights will be obliged to address? You've mentioned one or two of them already to do with the issue of our ageing society, ageing Europe. Well, yeah, but I think there's something around recognising the, the, the sober reality of where we're going because we're going to have further frustration. We're going to have people unable to access decent standards of education, of health in order to have their health needs met, in order to be part of their community. Going forward, we're seeing... Uh, you know, from my own area of, of, of marginalised communities, the, the disregard for trying to tackle uh, institutionalisation across Europe. So all of these issues are breeding a, 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 a continuous cycle of anger, poverty, reduced life standards, and many people are feeling that their, that their desire for emancipation is not being realised. I think we need to have some hope coming from the Commissioner. And in order to demonstrate hope, then there needs to be action and solutions on the table. And in order to get to those issues, I think this is where we need to start thinking about how does the commissioner articulate for civil society and for groups to actually resist the oppressive structures within society? So there's something around offering ideas or offering a, a platform for people to speak about what kind of practices can be taken in order to resist the, uh, the marginalization that they're experiencing on a daily basis. Because if you just take, for example, the issue of, of, uh, of older age population, I think it's something we've spoken about before, people's living standards have been getting, have been getting worse from my analysis, I think, and for, many, for many people on a lower social scale of, of society. And I think as we progress further in terms of years and in terms of months, we will have older people who will have continuously worse 
um, experiences on a day-to-day -day basis and will not see their voices being heard, will see a failure to access the various different areas of society, will see it We'll see aspects being improved and for some people the privileged and wealthy class within society being able to benefit from the way that society structures so forth. So we need to start making the conversation now as to how do we resist those issues and how do we challenge them. I think this is where we, we come back to this notion of human rights because if we go down the same route of creating a charters that we although we've got many charters already, or if we go down the route of saying we need to have uh, an opportunity to explore uh, what what you know what, what kind of human rights we want and where direction and which demographics we want to tackle and so forth. All we'll do is we'll we'll recreate this this function for government, which is to act as a disciplinary tool. So you use rights as a tool for di for disciplining those who kind of stray from the general direction. And I think this is where many social movements are frustrated with human rights is because we haven't got to an opportunity of being able to support people to explain and describe their level of, of, of marginalization and isolation and then have an opportunity to have those voices heard going forward. Because we need to offer an alternative to where we are in the, on the basis of human rights. So if the commissioners go down the same route of recycling the same ideas, of recycling those same narratives that we've, we've, we continuously see with the, with the emergence of policy agendas and directions and so forth, we will be in a worse situation in the future because the level of frustration is going to grow. So I think it's about trying to articulate what is the purpose of rights going forward and how do those rights become realised for many people on the ground. Uh, Mira, at the time of recording this conversation, the Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Jorben Jagland, has just finished his address to the Parliamentary Assembly. He gave a very uh, sober and sombre, in some ways, presentation of, of what has happened over the, over the previous year. And he appealed to the governments of Europe to continue to support the convention system and the work of the Council of Europe. So let's take that as the premise then. How do you think we can reinvigorate the respect for human rights because uh, we've had a conversation in previous podcasts where you dismiss the idea that the arc of history bends towards progress so that means then that we have to continue the council of europe has to be in the forefront of any of all efforts to maintain uh, respect for the convention system and the human rights uh, the, the the system of human rights that has evolved over the past uh, 40 50 60 years so in your view how can we best do that so I think one point, one place to start is what I refer to as this idea of, of futurology. And it's an interesting area of, of sociological research. And I was, I was speaking at an event uh, on the weekend regarding the impact of the British exit from the EU, uh, the impact it will have on children and young people. And the problem is, is that for many, for many um, areas of, of, of our globe, we kind of disregard the voices of young people and children in particular. But my issue I have is how individualized our conversations become when we talk to people who are marginalized and indeed when we talk to children and young people as well. Because, the issue, because my issue is, is that when we have discussions with people who have not had their, their, their human rights realized and are facing extreme marginalization and so forth, the conversation is always brought to the level of what do you want to do? What do you want to get out of this? What we don't do is actually give uh, resources and tools to such groups to actually explain and define how society should be organized or how the community should evolve and so forth. We just ask for very, very individualistic, simplistic answers as to what does this mean for you in your everyday experience. So I think what needs to firstly happen is, as I said before, try to map the, the current UN convention and the charters against living standards so we get a clearer picture. Then it's to go forward with trying to help people describe and explain their, their frustration, but also offer the alternative. Because the answer as to how do we want to just an equal society are already there. It doesn't, it's not gonna be something, it's gonna be a eureka moment. Many social justice um, campaigners and people who work within the areas of human rights have been articulating the same messages for, for many years. Uh, and this is a, a common fact of anybody who works in, 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 in marginalized issues. So what we need to do is actually offer that opportunity for those who are marginalized 
to be providing the vision for what the for what the future should be look like and how we should get to it. And I think that and in that conversation, it's very much the case of ensuring that marginalised children, and young people, also have those opportunities. Because I want to see an offer for an alternative society born out of out of those on the ground, and then I want to see the commissioner and the policymakers reflecting that. It's not the case, from my point of view, to have a commissioner or to have policymakers and decision makers being at the forefront of leading the ideas. The ideas emerge from the grassroots level. And when they emerge from the grassroots level, it's then the, 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 the role of the commissioner and the policymakers to be the facilitator for those ideas, to explore them. Because we've seen from our, from our evidence, and you know, we can Google it, we can look at academic searches and so forth, is that rights are only realized insofar that they contribute to the economic and political objectives of the states that we're referring to. So if we go down this route of just focusing purely on rights, I think we will be distracted from the inequality and inequity where within society. So we need to think about how we create resistance. But we also need to think about how we create those dialogues for the alternative future that we want. Is it possible to take human rights out of the machinery of statecraft so that it really does reside with the people and it's, it evolves at the, at the demand, at the, re, at the bequest of the people? Well, I think that's a really, a really interesting point because if we look at rights, I think sometimes we celebrate rights too easily. And I don't mean that in terms of just disregarding what, what many people fight for. But rights are a reflection of the, of the inequity within society. So if we focus too much on trying to take a rights-based approach without trying to address the, the causes and the, and the core issues that create this, this fluctuating levels of inequity and, 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 and the levels of, of being unequal and so forth, then I think there's a real risk of being distracted. And I say that because... For many campaigners, when we've done analysis of social movements um, who have been trying to fight for, for, for issues around oppression, what we see is that there is a real risk of becoming too closely aligned with the machinery of government. And I think there's, there's a great, uh, I think when in one of our previous talks, uh, I spoke about people who influenced me and the sociologist Michael Oliver and another one, Colin Barnes, who are both uh, academics uh, within, within disability studies. And one of the uh, most profound quotes uh, that, I, that I seem to go back to when I talk about a rights-based approach was that there's a risk of becoming too closely aligned to government. And if you do so, you then risk being incorporated and end up carrying on the, their proposals rather than actually the proposals of the social movements and the, and the people who want emancipation. Because the other one, which is a risk of being even, uh, even further more uh, marginalized and, and eventually on the route of, of being dismissed. Can I just so I think there, that there was a there was just a break in communication. You 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 mentioned where it broke down. You were talking about the fact that the the rights movement could be almost swallowed up by the by the government. So if you could just take it from there. Sure. So I think that the, the, uh, let me think. So the the scholars like Mike, Michael Oliver and Colin Barnes, who who work within disability studies, spoke about if you go down the rights based approach and therefore you align closely with government in order to try and get your messages heard, well, there is a risk that you'll become incorporated within the machinery of government, and then you end up just taking forward the proposals of, the, of those member states, rather than actually the, the ideas and agendas taken forward by, by the social movements. And I say that because if you look at a lot of, a lot of uh, civil society organizations, Many of them rely on the funding from government. So actually, how do you have a clear social movement and clear network of organizations that can challenge and critique effectively the actions and behaviors of the state when actually they rely on that funding in order to survive and exist? And then I think the, the alternative, which again is to take a, a more of a, um, of a stance of trying to combat and trying to uh, you know, bring down uh, these these mechanisms of power and so forth. Well, the risk there is then you become, you get too far away and you actually eventually end up being further marginalised and uh, eventually eventually just dismissed. But there is a basis of this idea of power, and I think in one of our very early conversations that we had when we used to do our Facebook interviews, I remember making the point that if you if you uh, if you don't challenge these mechanisms of power, 
then you effectively will will be disregarded. But there's a there's a more of a sense of how do you take ownership of the policies and the ideas brought forward from the, the likes of the commissioner and the policy making teams. Because if you take, I mean, I didn't re, I didn't hear the speech by the commissioner. But if you take the commissioner's speech and then you actually explore it with groups of people who are marginalised, how many of them do we think will be able to take? Uh, it will have resonance with what the, what that person said. How many of them would it articulate it in the ways that it was it was articulated in our agendas and policy documents and so forth? Because many of our tools that we create at this level and at this point in discussion bear no re- resemblance to what pe- how people articulate it, how people want to speak about it, and want to have their views heard on the ground. So we are detaching ourselves, and we risk just creating this pool where we discuss the issues. And other people who are who it affects on a daily basis feel further annoyed and frustrated. To be fair, I think the Secretary General's speech was aimed at a public of 47 people, those uh, people who are uh, effectively running the member states of the Council of Europe, one of whom will be here this week for the Parliamentary Assembly session, that is the Prime Minister of Denmark. Now, Denmark holds, uh, Miro, the chairmanship of the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers, and as one of its priorities, it's highlighted the need to tackle the issue of the uh, sexual abuse of children with disabilities. Now, from your own understanding of this issue, Miro, uh, what is the scale of the problem that that uh, we're faced with in Europe? Well, right. I mean, in terms of Europe or globally, there is there is deep concern for the crime, violence, uh, sexual assault, and abuse that goes on continuously and systematically against the failed people, uh, particularly those who are from. Uh, even further marginalised backgrounds. So if we take an intersectional approach to this, we would see that uh, people of LGBTQ community, women and children and so forth, are, are uh, very much reflected in the emerging data around this level of, of, of abuse and hostility and violence. And I think, as we know, you know made sale people should and want to be included in their communities and be valued and have a role in the resp- in, in, in responsibility within society. But to do this, we need to address the social world around us rather than the individual. So to take an approach of, say, of, of reinforcing narrat- narratives of, say, vulnerability or taking approaches which, which ultimately just protect uh, the individual is not going to actually t- uh, tackle the issue uh, at its core root. Yes, we need to have support for people who do experience such, such horrific uh, incidents, and, and violence, but there, there are two different narratives going on here. One is the protection and the support that's required continuously for people who experience this. The other is to try and tackle the issue of, and why it emerges in its entirety across Europe. And I think this is where we've we've got uh, we've got international response to this. So, for example, we've seen that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is a useful tool for us to consider. I suppose the action that we must take in order to try to stop such uh, crime and assaults from taking place. And in particular, we have the, the general comments from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, who, for example, in 2016 uh, adopted the Article uh, Article 6 on women and, ch- and girls with disabilities, and how there are issues there that need to be addressed in order to protect their rights, uh, protect their individual from, individuals from violence. But even more so, I think it's about taking a proactive approach to highlight the comments in the general comment around the right to, uh, the right to independent living, which was, um, which was adopted in 2017. Because the violence towards disabled people in Europe is invisible. And we have to recognize that it, it happens. But for many of us, we disregard it. Or for many of us, we don't provide a platform for it to actually emerge and for it to be explored further. The, I think the role of the Danish presidency is to amplify uh, the voices of people such as yourself and others who want something to be done. So what can be done? Or is it just that we just need to bring disabled youngsters into this conversation that we're having everywhere across Europe about the rights of children and the need to protect children from uh, sexual grooming and sexual abuse? What is the strategy that you would suggest is necessary to, to, to deal with an issue which I think we can both agree is probably underreported. Definitely. So I think uh, your, your second point was quite interesting around making sure the voice of, of 
children, young people are involved in these debates, and and that's very much the case. What I would probably be advising if I was in that position would be to think about the philosophy regarding independent living. Of course, that philosophy being having the right level of of, of support to do the things you want to do with your life, because it's about having choice and control over one's life and receiving the right level of support in order to have self-determination over the activities of everyday living. Because if we don't see the link between a failure to have uh, or to realize the independent living philosophy and, a, and, a, and an emergence of this data that we're talking about, then we will never be able to tackle the issue effectively. Because we've got across Europe institutionalization, we've got issues around people being placed in certain environments, which therefore you have uh, you know, re- reduced support, you have uh, uh, you have your views uh, sidelined, your, your, your experience is controlled by the systems and structures, and that's where we breed this issue of, of inferiority and intolerance, because for many tail people, they are perceived as being inferior to everybody else, and when, that, when you have that notion of inferiority, you then have this equation to, I'll be able to do things because I think it's justifiable, or you can do things because you think that person won't be able to have their voice heard in the system. And so forth. So I don't think it's an, just an approach of saying, you know, better checks and balances and, and, and safeguarding in, in inverted commas. It's about trying to get to a point of, of supporting that philosophy of having more choice and control over everyday life. Because, because you know, historically we've seen that for many disabled people, they have reduced uh, chances to gain meaningful employment. They have a lack of opportunities to build friendships. They have inaccessible environments to be part, inaccessible transport and inaccessible environments that they want to try and access and so forth. For many sale people, they are, you know, we're, statistically, sale people are, are, are overrepresented in poverty. So all this together breeds this culture of attacks, violence, um, the issue of sale people just being dismissed um, and, and therefore things can be done to them and so forth. So if we want to try and tackle it, I think it's it's recognizing this this addition that that this violence and this and this hostility and this and these disgusting acts are part of a layer that prevents the sale people from having choice and control of their life, and that's what we should be trying to address. My main concern on one particular issue that we've seen when um, sale people have been in these situations and and this is and their their experiences are being recorded. Is that for many people who do experience such such horrific violence and attacks, for many of them it happens from the from the individual who they 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 relate to on a on a daily basis, possibly uh, somebody who provides care and support, uh, you know, people within this, these kind of systems and structures. And what um, and what sh- frightens me a lot is how when issues are raised about violence or abuse towards self people in institutionalized settings and so forth. Firstly, we don't try and challenge the institutionalization agenda that's going on, which, which places this person in that, in that position in the first instance. But equally worrying is this, is this tolerance of just trying to take, it as, take the issue as an, as a, almost at an administrative level. So if somebody abuses or attacks, say, a person, and therefore is in a position of employment within the system, and rather than actually go through a criminal justice procedure, the person is sacked or the person has moved to a different department to provide support to other people and so forth. So it's trying to tackle institutionalization on the ground. It's trying to tackle the, the reduced opportunities to have choice of control over our lives and to have a voice in, 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 everyday, in everyday agendas. But it's also trying to realize that when things do happen, there are proper procedures that can take place in order to ensure it doesn't just get swept under the carpet. It doesn't just get moved aside. It isn't dealt with as an administrative issue but it does follow a procedure where people can have their voices heard at a prosecution and law enforcement level. Indeed, this is definitely a subject that we'll return to in future podcasts, Miro. Um, For our last uh, topic of conversation, I'd like to turn to the issue of prisons. This week at the Council of Europe, uh, experts are meeting to revise uh, prison rules. And a quick flick of the newspapers here in France and in the UK shows that the conditions in which uh, inmates live 
uh, are back in the news. There's a, um, an industrial dispute here in France. There has been a spate of, uh, of, of violent attacks within prisons. But beyond that, there's also this concern about what we're supposed to do with the increasing number of people who are convicted for terrorist offences. So if we bring all those together, I just wonder what your thoughts are as somebody who's interested in human rights, uh, Mira. So I think that the, the first thing to recognise is that we need to take a little bit of a, of a step back, I suppose, and try to assess the issue with a little bit of rational thought. And I say that because so often when we look at these debates and, and, and conversations, the only kind of response typically from, from member states is to resort to the kind of, uh, you know, the conditions around pandering to the fear of crime with increasing harshness, attacking civil liberties, uh, attempting to control very large uh, contingents of society, who most often are not, uh, you know, represent the poorest people within within society. So I suppose when we look at these these, these policy uh, issues, or we look at these kind of topics that emerge in terms of the ones you know you've highlighted in the recent news articles and newspapers in in, in Western Europe and so forth, is to recognise that when we're trying to tackle, when we're trying to discuss these issues we need to take a constructive approach and take it down to the fundamental causes as to why this is happening. So, for example, when I look at issues around uh, you know, isolation or the use of, of provisions of, of, of resources to, to prisoners and so forth, um, I think what we talk we think about is the social disintegration and think about why this is happening. Why are there more resources being directed to certain contingents within society rather than the general public? And that's the reason how you try to deal with rising crime or you deal with crime in particular areas. It's not to resort to further criminalization, further stigmatization. It's to say, well, why is this social disintegration happening? Why is this anger emerging from, from such communities and so forth? And then you go forward from there. And when, I, when, I, when you, um, you know, spoke to me in the last couple of weeks about you know, the general comment topics that we may want to cover, I was just trying to reflect back on, on some of the lectures that I've been to and, and some of the reading that I've done you know, throughout my, my, my life trajectory on, on human rights. And I always remember Angela Davis, uh, the, the kind of uh, activist from America uh, linked to civil rights movements and so forth, who spoke, and I'm, I'm very much uh, you know, paraphrasing here, but spoke about this issue of institutional violence leads to personal violence uh, and then you, all, you almost just look for instant solutions rather than the kind of fundamental causes, because all levels of violence are entwined. So you can have, you know, foreign domestic policy, which which kind of affects substantial amounts of, of the community, those who are on low socioeconomic platforms. And this leads to uh, enacted aggressiveness. It leads to hostile policies becoming uh, becoming internalized. So people are angry at the situation. That, and therefore, that's then reflected in 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 the policies for prison, it's reinflected in the in the policies of service delivery and service design for certain groups of people and so forth. So altogether, you have this just general feeling of of anger and frustration, which will trickle down to the people that we're talking about, which then just creates this cycle that we are we are forever in until we want to try to tackle this 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 fundamental cause. And I say it because if you look at criminal ju criminal justice as a, as a as a kind of policy area or a direction of of government. It, criminal justice shouldn't be about trying to further criminalise uh, the so-called unwanted population and in doing so try and scare everybody else away. It's about trying to say what is the ultimate goal of our, of our, of our uh, for, what's the ultimate goal of, of the issue that we're trying to talk about in hand, which is looking at why do people become radicalised. It's looking at why is this, is there further dis disintegration in our, in our social structures and within our communities? Why is there over-representation of certain demographics within the criminal justice system? That's the ultimate goal that we want to answer. It's not trying to further criminalise individuals already in the system. That may well be true, Amira, but there's enough evidence to say, suggest that uh, that particular ship has sailed and that for the last 20 or 30 years we've been uh, political policy and certainly media policy has been driven by this uh, prison works uh, model. So we are where we are, so to speak. So what, what should happen now? Uh, there's two things here that I want to, to, to discuss with you. First one is the data that I've seen suggests that recorded crime is going down whilst fear of crime is either staying stable or increasing. 
So how, how do you account for this as a sociologist? What is happening in society where people are more and more terrified, even though the, the, likely, the likelihood of them being a victim of crime has been reduced? Well, if you look at the kind of uh, rhetoric and language used by member states around law enforcement, it's taking a much more tougher line on the issue of surveillance, on the issue of security, on the issue of trying to justify uh, foreign policy and so forth. So there is a general fear, uh, and I do agree with the idea of, of there, is a, there is a level of fear, because if you look at all our narratives from the media, from the politicians, from the, um, the, the kind of mainstream uh, channels of communication and so forth, we are constantly just stuck in this cycle of talking about reactions to uh, issues around war or terrorism, and then that, how that links into trying to scrutinize and try to su su um, survey and, and follow certain groups of people and so forth. And really, the, 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 although the level of crime may be going down from the, from the reports that, that, we, that, we're, that we're talking about, I think that what we're missing in this conversation is the, the basic necess necessities that people need in order to live their life. Because if you don't have the basic necessities of, of, of daily living, and therefore you don't feel that you're a valued member of the community, and you feel that there has been an agenda in order to further stigmatize or marginalize you on a daily basis, then it will lead to what we refer to as criminal activity. So given the fact that um, the reports that I would pull out would be the ones that show that, you know, for example, incarcerations and prison sentences and so forth lead to, a, to the perpetual cycle of poverty. I think we need to analyze, rather than just look at the reports and kind of uh, talk about, you know, why does this data show this? I would be talking about, well, are there is, is there satisfactory analysis on the social, political, and economic factors at play which are within the areas where there are high levels of crime? Because I don't see enough conversation on that. I just see and I just see more conversations around trying to justify uh, harsher sentencing. I see more justifications on trying to dismantle human rights agendas uh, or human rights legislation frameworks in order to try to appease this this fear and safety concerns going on in many countries. I don't see enough talking about a rational argument for the political and economic and social choices that those in power take. Which, which actually ultimately affect a high level of crime in certain areas of society. I think that's a, a podcast theme right there, just on that. But if we can just go back to this last point then, about how we should deal as a human rights as a human rights based society, how we should deal with uh, the number of uh, people being sent to prison for terrorist offences, because we've got two models emerging. One where we just treat this as uh, these people are criminals, they will be treated as criminals, they will do their sentence and they will leave. Uh, and nobody has confidence in that, in that approach now, particularly as we've seen too many, too many cases where people have gone into prison, they have been radicalised. For example, the butcher of Toulouse, who killed uh, children at a Jewish school in 2012, he was radicalised in prison. We've had the, uh, the brothers Kaushi, at least one of them was was imprisoned and met uh, Koulibaly, who um, who went on to kill a policeman and four shoppers at a Jewish supermarket just after the Kaishi brothers had uh, killed so many journalists at, um, at Charlie Hebdo. So we've seen then there have been too many cases where the prison system has almost been a, a recruiting center for, for future jihadists. But we've also got the other extreme, these American supermax prisons where we know that uh, prisoners don't have uh, visitation rights and, and, and there's a lot of concern about the impact on their on their psyche as a result of being in such extreme prison conditions. So as a human rights activist, as a sociologist, what, what are your thoughts on that? Where should Europe be? Because increasingly Britain and France are moving towards this segregation model. What is your advice on that? Well, I think, you know, listening to what you're saying, it doesn't take away from the harshness of those situations. But we, we, you know, we see many examples of, of similar uh, grain across the entire globe. And it comes, I, I feel, it comes from this idea of not just talking about how perhaps prisons affect this radicalization, but thinking about the choices and decisions we take on a daily basis and how they perpetuate this issue of 
trying to value one community over another, trying to protect one community over another and so forth. Because I, it's, it's, hard trying, it's, hard, it's hard for me to try to, to grapple with, with such complexity of what we're talking about in a, in a short space of time. But I think it's about trying to reposition this, this debate around how do we contribute towards this, this cycle of terror and violence emerging. Because when you talk, when you said about you know prisons and so forth adding to it, I would say I, my immediate response would be, well, I want to look at foreign policy of certain countries and how that affects people's dissatisfaction and anger. I want to think about the ultranationalism that is gripping many, many parts of the world and how that articulates certain views of of people within society and how that breeds the anger and hostility and how we can have uh, certain narratives within our kind of mainstream agendas. Which, which, which don't necessarily promote extreme um, or, or the, the vivid ideas of violence and, and hostility, but there is an underlying tone of justifying, for example, racial profiling or justifying, for example, the treatment of uh, people with mental health conditions uh, or people who are black or have certain religious faiths in our different sec- sections of society. So it needs, a, in, for me, it needs a more comprehensive uh, analysis but it also needs to call out this this underlying unsettling feel of of what I would refer to as almost this kind of friendly friendly nationalist principles that we have so often in, in areas of in areas of our in our of, of our continent, which is allowing this to continue and is trying to deliberately shift the debate to one of saying it's the problem of the other person, it's not the problem of what I think and what I do. Because, you know, for example, um, I won't name any countries, but we've seen policies where we say it's the responsibility of the university or of the school system or of the health service to, to, to identify areas of radicalization. It's the fault of, of, of this system or this structure and so forth. And for me, it's about saying, well, hold on, as individuals in society, can we uh, analyze our own status? our own views and values towards certain groups within society? And can we be part of that process to try to reposition what it means to be a human being in society? Because anything else, I feel, is just trying to stick large-scale plasters over a problem which is going to continue, if not dealt with satisfactory. People will hear what you say, Miro, and think that this is the classic liberal dodge, that, in fact, you, you're bringing in all these wider social, cultural, political uh, uh, forces to bear on a, a subject which is precise and demands a, a, an answer. As human rights defenders, we have to uh, extend human rights coverage even to places, uh, even to penitentiaries, places where people have been incarcerated. And Europe is increasingly faced with a situation where increasing numbers of young men are being imprisoned for terrorist offences or even for just uh, petty crimes, as they call them in the UK. These men are coming into contact with others who who have it as a vocation to turn them into the jihadi warriors of the future. Now, how does human rights, the, the concept of human rights, the system that we've evolved over the last 50 or 60 years, deal with that situation? That is the nub. How do we deal with it? Without bringing in all these other uh, social, cultural forces to bear, how does human rights respond to that situation? Okay, so I think there's, there's a number of kind of things I pick out from what you're saying. First, the first point to make is that our life doesn't operate in silos. So I think we do have to bear, bear and take a, a bit more of a, of a wraparound approach in, in terms of daily living and try to analyze this. Secondly, I would talk about the, the importance of human rights, if we are to take a rights-based approach, is to protect people's civil liberties and their status as human beings. And we need to use that line unwaveringly and in solidarity in order to show the significance and the importance of it. Failing to do so then just undermines human rights in its entirety and, and therefore leads to areas where we've seen uh, the dismantling of human rights provisions and legislations. All the idea of human rights being uh, available for the deserving and not available for the so-called under-deserving. But I think there is an issue, and this is where I, this is where I have to try and you know, come back at it, is to say, well, if I look at areas of our society which has gone through immense austerity measures and where we've seen prison conditions falling and failing, which for some they may say, who cares? 
nobody cares about so-called prisoners in these situations. But actually, the way you know, again, go back to basic necessities. If they are if they are met, it's going to breed more anger and hostility and so forth. But we've also seen the dismantling and the evaporation of uh, youth workers, of uh, community liaison uh, workers, of people in the community trying to build cohesion and collaboration. All of this is being dismantled at the same time of not necessarily trying to address the issues that you've highlighted. So if you don't look at the issues of community partners, of people involved in trying to build community cohesion, of trying to celebrate the importance of human rights unwaveringly and build that, that collaboration together across all these different areas and so forth. If you don't do any of that, then the reaction response is to say, you need to have further scrutiny, you need to have further security, further um, uh, mass incarceration of, of individuals and so forth. And all the evidence, as you've alluded to, Nigel, shows that for those who have gone down that position, it hasn't led to anything being addressed. It has actually just led to people of certain statuses in society being further impoverished and breeding further anger, further hostility, and further reaction when they have opportunities to try and come back at that. I think it's about trying to show show hope and solidarity to people who are angry, but also ask why are people angry? Ask people in the prison system, why are you angry? Where do you feel you've been failed and let down? Can you understand the anger from other people in the community as well? Because the problem that we have is those with the, with the incredible power in society are very happy for those who are in these situations that we're talking about to point the fingers at each other, to blame each other in these circumstances without actually trying to say, is there a wider analysis that needs to take place here? As a, as a last question, Miro Griffiths, what, what can we do strategically, specifically, to build support for human rights? Because if we don't, you will recognise, we've had this conversation before, if we don't do this, support will decline. And that those people who were much more interested in pointing the finger and saying, that group over there is to blame, we need to roll back some of these so-called victories in order to have a society that works better for you. Those people will hold sway. So what specifically can we do? What, what are your recommendations? Because I think this going forward will be the key conversation that we'll have in these podcasts. Okay. And it'd be interesting if you ask that question to other people as well to try and see what I'm different ideas I'm doing you get. my research on air. <laughs> yeah, but what I would, what I would say... I, and the first one is going to be a, a kind of you know, go back to the issue of solidarity. I want the commissioner to be the facilitator of international support for the topics that we're talking about. It's not to come up with the ideas, as I've said. It's to actually say that you need to build an international movement of solidarity on the issues that we're talking about. Because if you don't, it's finished. It's com the idea of human rights and protecting civil liberties will be finished without international support. But the second point I would make is this in the, the significance of archiving activism. Because there's a great quote, if you don't remember your history, you're like a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree. And uh, as a researcher on social movement studies, I have seen how so many uh, uh, campaigners on human rights have talked about the need to collect and archive what they're doing, but not have it archived by the central processes of power, not have it archived by these large-scale uh, tools of, of, of government or these neoliberal uh, education systems and so forth. It's about having the resources and the tools for the activists to create their own archives, to create their own memories and histories that can then be used and utilized in subsequent years and so forth. Because I don't want to make uh, comparisons between where we are now in certain areas and where we were historically in the 1940s and so forth. But how many times do we want to have a conversation where we say, oh, this is very, this feels similar to this in history? Or how many times do we want to look back uh, on ourselves and think, are we ashamed by the actions that we, take, that we took? Because I can tell you now, I'm 28 now, but when I'm in my 60s, if I'm still alive when I'm in my 60s, I will look back on my life and I know that I will be ashamed of the way that we as a society has collectively allowed the marginalization and isolation of many people in our community and in our world as well. So I think it's about facilitating that international solidarity. It's about creating the archive to retain our memories. And it's about giving people on the ground the opportunities and the hope 
to realize the vision of how they want their society to function and be organized. Stop reducing it to the individual level of saying, what do you want to do? And if you want to go and do that, then you should try hard. And if you don't try hard, you failed. But it's about saying, how do we ensure that every generation that we're talking to, that every aspect and contingent of our community, whether that is in prison, whether that is residing in institutionalized uh, areas, whether it is part of our health system or uh, employment sector and so forth, is asking everybody and trying to come up with a situation where people can have their political voice heard, but they understand the importance of trying to articulate a vision for the future together. If you start on those platforms, then there's going to be a better hope for society in the future. If we continue down the road of quick reactions and crisis-driven agendas, I don't think we're going to succeed very far. Thank you. Cheers.